thanks very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, if I use any big words that you don't understand, you're allowed to shoot a hand up. And if I do it a second time, I'm expecting a few projectiles. So um, please let me know. Okay, so just a bit of an overview about what I'd like to cover. Um, just to look at some data from Australia about complications from obesity. I'm going to talk about some of the grim stuff first, but we won't dwell on it. And then we'll go on to talk about some of the comorbidities and things that I think we can do things about. Uh, I'll just touch on uh, fatty liver disease, talk about some of the sleep and respiratory complications, cardiorespiratory things. Some of the other complications that we don't know much about, there's a, a bit of a gap in the literature and in our knowledge base. And finally, but um, not necessarily less importantly, some of the psychosocial complications of obesity. And actually there's a big gap in our knowledge base there when we think about things that are directly related to obesity. So psychosocial complications from obesity. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about future options. I've got to put the spectacles on now. Okay, so these are data um, from here in Victoria, um, looking at um, 163 cases uh, from the 1950s up until more recently in 2010, and looking at survival um, over a period of time. And what you can see is that about there's about a 94% probability of survival up to the age of 20, and about 87% up to the age of about 34. Um, survival drops off after that, um, but the numbers that they had in the study beyond that age were really quite small, so I don't think we should make too much um, after the age of 34, but survival is actually really pretty good up until that stage. Um, if we try and tease out a little bit about what does obesity factor into that survival, well, we do know that obesity does decrease survival in this cohort, so that it certainly did play a role. So if you look at um, this survival curve over time, so the black line at the top, does my little arrow come up? here are the patients that didn't have obesity and if you look at their survival it chugs along pretty nicely there's no decrease in survival if you look at the ones that did have the complicating factor of obesity it does start to drop off so we do know that obesity does uh, engender a reduction in survival over time if you pull out the patients from that set of data and look at well what were the things that actually um, contributed to that reduction in survival um, they brought out a, a few points um, so th these are actually the patients, if you look down, males and females, oops, sorry, uh, if you, this is their um, genotype, uh, these are their BMIs, um, and their age uh, at death was here. And if you look at some of the things that the older patients passed away from, they're mainly cardiorespiratory causes, so it's heart failure, it's respiratory failure, it's um, high blood pressure on the right side of the heart and in the lungs. Uh, sometimes it's blood clots on the lungs, so pulmonary embolism, those sorts of things. Um, so we need to have a look at whether um, obesity and overweight is actually playing a role in contributing to that increased incidence of heart failure and lung failure. Um, we know from other data sets that younger patients, if they do pass away at an earlier age, there's an increased role of lung infections and those sorts of things in children at a younger age. Um, so they make the point that cardiac and respiratory causes were the most common causes um, and um, there is an important association between obesity and it's critical therefore that we look at ways we can prevent obesity uh, and manage um, hyperphagia um, or that increased drive to eat in our patients. So that's the grim stuff. Moving on. Um, what else do we know about the way that patients with Prader-Willi syndrome have their body set up, so body composition. So by that we mean how is fat distributed within the body and is it different from the way that patients with non-Prader-Willi syndrome obesity have fat distributed in their body. And I guess over the last 10 to 15 years there's been increasing information from research about the fact that it probably is different. So if you look at patients who've got general obesity and patients with Prader-Willi syndrome, the way that fat's distributed is probably a little bit different. So what we know is that patients with Prader-Willi syndrome have fat probably more in what we call the subcutaneous depot, so that's under the skin, compared to patients with general obesity and less fat inside the abdomen, so in the tummy, and we call that visceral fat because it's around the um, organs inside the abdomen. And we also know that they have less what we call lean body mass, so that's everything else, that's muscle and bones. So they've got um, sort of less of the good stuff that actually helps to keep your um, energy metabolism up, and we heard Owen talking about in the, in the last talk. 
So there's less muscle, um, but there's actually less of the bad fat, which is the stuff inside the abdomen, and there's more of the subcutaneous fat. Um, and associated with that, there have been some um, data that suggest that if you take Prada Willie patients and general obese patients from the same what we call body mass index, and I'm sure everyone here is probably familiar with that term, um, that they may be actually more sensitive to insulin. So by that we mean that insulin is able to do its job better. Um, but there are some other data that say, well, actually, it's probably about the same. So we, I don't think we're completely clear on that, but most of the data would tend to support that. And yet we also know that patients with prader willi syndrome still get diabetes and high blood pressure and high cholesterol and all those other things. So we need to somehow reconcile those conflicting, conflicting bits of information. So let's have a look at some of the data sets and see what we can draw out from that. So these are some data from um, the UK, um, now about sort of 13 or 14 years old. Um, and they, um, so this is from Tony Holland's group. So they got all the Prada Willie patients from one region in the UK. Um, it was by interview this information was gathered, so by report, so not by getting it from um, examining the patient. So sometimes there's um, some disadvantages of doing it that way. And what they tried to do was look at body mass index in younger cohort and in the older cohort. And what you can see there is that the older cohort definitely had a higher BMI. So they were definitely obese. And in the younger cohort, uh, those patients um, were just at the top of the healthy weight range. Um, and they looked at the patients who had diabetes and who didn't have diabetes, and there was certainly a trend towards having a higher body mass index in the patients who had diabetes, but it didn't quite reach what we call statistical significance, but there was definitely a trend there. And the other thing that they saw, as we also see in the general population, is that there was a trend towards having a positive family history for diabetes. So we shouldn't forget about the usual things that happen in the general population. If there's a family history for diabetes, we need to not forget about those things in our Prada Willie patients as well. It didn't quite reach statistical significance, but I just had it there because we shouldn't forget about it either. This is a, a bigger data set and more recent from a couple of years ago from the Dutch group. Um, 102 patients um, in a wide age range from 18 to 66. Um, and you can see that the UPD and deletions there were not too different, so 44 and 55 patients with each. And what they did here was really quite good, I think. If you get a chance to have a look at this paper, and I'm happy to, the reference I've got down the bottom there, but it'd be well worth a look. Um, what they did was looked at the comorbidities, so that, those are the diseases that the patients have, a really long list, a very extensive list. They had a really good look and examined the patients uh, and took a history for all of those, so it was very detailed. And they broke it up by looking um, at the different classes of body weight, so whether they were obese, overweight or normal weight. They also broke it up by their genetic subclass, so whether they had um, a deletion, UPD or another genetic um, subtype. And they also then wanted to look at what comorbidities they had based on their age. So did things change as patients progressed through life? So it was a really nice look at their cohort. And what they found in relationship to body mass index was that there was a significant relationship between how overweight or obese you were and the uh, incidence of having high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, snoring, um, swelling of the legs, and infections, skin infections. And those were really the only things that came out as being associated with being overweight or obese. Type 2 diabetes and the skin infections also increased with age. Those were also significant. When you looked at the genetic subtypes, it didn't appear that the things that were different between those t genetic subtypes really, to me, had any sig significant relationship to being obese. So there were definitely things that were different between the genetic subtypes, but to me, I couldn't pick them out that they were necessarily related to uh, having any relationship with obesity. So, so just getting back to this concept of the difference in distribution of body fat, this really came about in the early 2000s from Tony Holland's group when they looked at a sm small cohort of women, eight of them, and looked at lean women and obese women and did these CT scans. So this is taking a, a CAT scan through the abdomen and then it's as if we sort of sliced you in half like a magician would and we're looking inside your abdomen. And that top picture is looking inside um, an obese woman's abdomen and the bottom one is looking inside a woman with prader willi syndrome's abdomen. And what you can see up here is that there's more white stuff inside the abdomen than there is down here. And the white stuff inside the abdomen up there is fat tissue. So the, 
th and this was consistent across the sort of patient cohort that they looked at. So there was more fat inside the abdomen and obese women, even though you match them for their body mass index. So their BMI was the same, but the obese women had more fat inside their abdomen. And then what they did was they looked at their blood glucose and how much insulin they were making and their cholesterol and those sorts of things. And what they found was some interesting things. Um, and if I can just draw your attention, I can use my mouse as well, I think. Does that show up on all the screens when I move the mouse? Yeah. Okay. Is that um, if you look at the prada Willy group over here and you look at their blood glucose and you look at the obese group and you look at the um, non-obese group, they've actually all got pretty similar blood glucoses. If, if you look at their insulin levels, you'll see that the, is my mouse gone? Um, obese group's got a really high insulin level, meaning that they're resistant to insulin, so they're insulin resistant. Um, this is the non-obese group, and the prada willi group falls in between, and that level was significantly different from the obese group. So even though they've got the same body mass index, they're more what we call <coughs> insulin sensitive. If we look at their lipids, again, it's similar. The prada willi group has got triglycerides much closer to the non-obese group. So their lipid profile was much similar to the non-obese group than to the obese group. And this is thought to be due to the fact that they've got less intra-abdominal fat, which is sort of bad fat that we tend to associate um, in the obese population with diabetes and bad cholesterol and heart disease and risk for heart attacks and strokes. Um, Okay, so how do we then reconcile this with the fact that we still know that our patients with prader willi syndrome get diabetes and they do get high cholesterol and they do get hypertension and other things later in life? So how do we put this all together? Because I'm telling you that um, they've got less fat inside them and they're sort of more insulin sensitive. So how do we put it all together? So I'm just going to show you a couple of other bits of data that might help us sort of put a story together. So... Um, these are some data from a couple of years ago looking at this concept of metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome really is just a way of saying that you are or are not at risk for having cardiovascular disease. So it puts together a collection of whether you have got um, a big waist circumference, high cholesterol and triglycerides, high blood pressure and high blood glucose. And if you've got about three out of five of those, then we say that you're in at increased risk for cardiovascular disease and for those sorts of things. So this was again quite a big group of people from Italy, 108 patients. Um, they had 85 patients who didn't have prada willi syndrome and of the prada um, willi patients that was a breakdown of males to females. Um, and if you look inside the prada willi group they divided them up into those who were obese and not obese. So they really had three groups. They had the prada willi group who were overweight and obese and not obese and then they had the um, obese controls. Okay, And then they wanted to see who had metabolic syndrome and who didn't have metabolic syndrome. So they're trying to explore or tease out this issue of, well, we still know that people with prader willi syndrome are at risk for these cardiovascular uh, risk factors. So what they found overall was about 34% of the patients in the prader willi group, the whole prader willi group, had metabolic syndrome. And it was um, only one person in the non-obese prader willi syndrome met that criteria. And obviously, obesity or having high waist circumference is one of the trigger points, so that's going to be a little bit of a confounder. But um, I guess what we're getting at here is that obesity is, a, is still a significant risk factor for a higher glucose, a higher triglyceride, and all those other things. So even though I've been saying that patients still have less fat, there is still is a significant risk for obesity in triggering these other things over time. I'm going to show you some more data in a second. So what you can see here on this graph is that if you're obese and have prader willi syndrome, you still have a significant frequency of having metabolic syndrome. It's similar to the obese controls here. Um, they still had um, slightly higher triglycerides than the non-obese um, prader willis, um, and they still tended to have slightly lower HDL, that's your good cholesterol or protective cholesterol. I think this was a little bit of a confounder and they tried to sort it out. So they had about 22 patients in the obese group of prader willi who had already had diabetes. So that's actually going to trigger you into having the metabolic syndrome because it's one of the criteria. So they did take them out and look at it again and they still had a significant number of people who met the criteria for the metabolic syndrome. So how, how is this so? How do we put it all together? Well, I think we can go back to some of this older data and I think what it's telling us is this, and I'll try to walk you through it. If we look at obese patients with prader willi syndrome, um, 
what they've done here, VFA is visceral fat, so this is the fat inside the abdomen. They've taken obese patients with Prader-Willi syndrome and here are some obese controls. And they've then divided them up into two groups. So those that have actually got quite a lot of fat inside the abdomen, so that's this group here on the left, and this group here yeah, on the right. Um, and look at, looking at their glucose, you can actually see they're quite different. So in fact, even within the obese group and Prader-Willi syndrome, the more fat you've got in the abdomen, the more you start to look like a regular person with obesity. So your blood glucose is higher and your cholesterol tends to be higher as well. So if you actually look at the group as a whole across to the obese controls, you can actually see that the obese patients with Prader-Willi syndrome with more fat in their abdomens look pretty much like our obese population with lots of fat in their abdomen. So I think what it's telling us is that whilst there is this tendency for patients with Prader-Willi syndrome to be more insulin sensitive, that if we allow obesity to happen, the more obese they get, the more they start to look like our regular population of patients who have a tendency to develop diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension. So the key really is to prevent obesity because eventually we will allow those things to happen. I think to me, collectively, that's what the data is telling me when I put it all together. Okay, so fatty liver disease is a common occurrence in um, overweight and obese patients. Um, I haven't seen any reports in the literature of an increase in this or in cirrhosis, and it may just be that with life expectancy, we don't see cirrhosis have enough time to evolve. Um, this study's from last year, um, looking at about 20 patients who they matched for percent body fat, which I thought was clever. And they did an ultrasound of the liver, and in fact, the incidence of um, fat within the liver was a lot less in patients with Prader-Willi syndrome, probably because they do have less fat inside their abdomens. One of the clever things that they did was they actually then matched the group for BMI. And what they found was um, they actually, so go back one step, when they matched them for percent body fat, they had no difference in insulin sensitivity. But if you match them for BMI, the insulin sensitivity in the Prader-Willi group was lower. So it just tells me that maybe when we're doing these studies, we have to think about how we match the patients and whether matching them for BMI is actually the right way to do it and whether we should actually be matching them for percent body fat. So whether our data is actually telling us the right thing. Sorry, did I just say the wrong thing? I'm on high, have I made a boo-boo on there? Yeah, sorry. Okay, metabolic complications. Um, so o overall, obesity seems to be driving an increase in prevalence of metabolic complications that I've mentioned. Um, and I guess the question we don't know is where on the curve this starts to, to go up because we've looked at things categorically, it, at BMI and categories, rather than um, looking at where that inflection point for risk might actually be. Okay, sleep. We know that there are lots of things that can contribute to respiratory compromise. So things like craniofacial dysmorphism, adenotonsillar hypertrophy, um, hypotonia, abnormal ventilatory control and sleep disordered breathing. Um, obstructive sleep apnea can also happen in this patient population because of a lot of those things. We also know there's abnormal sleep structure in both REM and non-REM, there's central sleep apnea, and also excessive daytime somnolence, which can't actually be completely accounted for by all of these things. And then we know on top of that, obesity can contribute to nocturnal hypoventilation, which can then lead to some respiratory failure. So obesity is kind of um, accelerating the, the risk for sleep and respiratory compromise. For coronary artery disease, we know there's a few case reports. There's no hard evidence for increased risk, but it may be hidden again because of reduced life expectancy. Um, there are some surrogate markers. Um, so there's substitute markers for cardiovascular risk in some studies. Um, but I think that we need to just treat risk factors appropriately because the data around risk for coronary artery disease aren't completely clear. We haven't got any hard outcome markers. What about heart failure? So we saw in those Victorian data that heart failure is one of the causes of increased risk. And I think death, and I think there are some mechanisms to explain that. Some are around the sleep disorder breathing, which I've mentioned. So the central regulation um, of breathing is disturbed. Um, obesity can then suppress the ability to breathe, particularly when there's reduced drive to breathe anyway. And then we have obstruction to breathing as well related to obesity. Um, pulmonary hypertension can happen, and we don't know whether that's um, related to those things or the possibility there could be blood clots and other things as well. We've got high blood pressure and hypertonia. So we probably need to treat all of those things together.
Just a couple of other things quickly, just got a couple of slides left. Um, I couldn't really find any data to show whether blood clots and, and PEs are increased in this group over and above other patients. I'm not sure if other people are aware of that data. Um, skin infections and cellulitis are, and we know that that can be related to skin picking. We know the infection is greater in patients who are obese, and that could be compounded by lymphedema. I couldn't find any data related to infections related to fatty abdominal aprons. We know that's increased in the general population with obesity, but I couldn't find whether there's any additional risk above and beyond in prader willi syndrome. And finally, I just want to mention some psychosocial issues because being obese is traumatising for everybody. It doesn't matter whether you've got prader willi syndrome or you've got obesity not related to prader willi syndrome. And we know there's lots of data out there um, on the prevalence of psychiatric uh, mood and behavioural disturbance in prader willi syndrome. And including relating to lots of the, the genetic subtypes. But I couldn't find any specific data related to the effect of obesity specifically on mood and anxiety in this patient population. So what does being obese mean to me in terms of my mood as opposed to um, psychiatric disturbances in general in this patient population? So I think there is a little gap in the literature and some things that we can do there. And obviously obesity can impact things like toileting and hygiene, patient transfers, transport, walking, all sorts of things, and all of this can have an impact on socialisation, work and self-esteem. So I think, although I've sort of said all of those things, and I guess in some ways it's a very negative thing when you're talking about complications, I think there is some good news behind it, and that is that this generation of patients that are coming through now really do have an opportunity to avoid a lot of these things that I'm talking about. And the younger cohort that we see coming through um, really are coming through to us in a much healthier way than the older patients that um, we have existing in our clinics. Um, there's some great data out there in the posters that I'd encourage you to have a look at, particularly around growth hormone and prevention of diabetes uh, and pre prevention of... Um, abnormalities in body composition. So I'd encourage you to treat risk factors as we normally would, treat sleep disorder breathing, and we need more research. Um, I might leave it there. Thank you, everyone.